There's no shortage of text-driven adventure games on the Mac. They were fairly popular in the 80s and made a solid run into the mid-90s, thanks mainly to a piece of software called World Builder, an advanced game engine that made putting this sort of title together very easy. And I thought today on yesteryear's Mac games we'd look at one such example. This is Grail Quest, a world builder powered adventure across the England of Arthurian legend that sees the player visiting cathedrals, finding weapons, fighting ruffians, and typing out the cardinal directions an awful lot. Text sits on the right, black and white visuals sit on the left. It's all fairly rudimentary, but had fairly modest system specifications as a result. This title will run on the Macintosh 512K and up to anything running System 6. System 7 breaks all early World Builder games due to being 32-bit. Thus, to actually play this, as I don't have a Mac running System 6, I've imaged the floppies and plonked them in the Mini VMac emulator running on my main tower. Grail Quest came in a fairly slim box, with cover art unceremoniously copied from a book called The Outlaw of Torn. On the back is a bit of blurb and some screenshots of two versions. It also hit DOS. Unlike most Macs of the 80s, the majority of PCs were capable of colour, so the DOS version looks significantly better, if a bit boring. Photographs for in-game graphics have never really done it for me. Within this box is some sturdy cardboard to protect the contents. Within that is a registration card. A promotional slip with other products published by Artworks, the discs, and the manual. Within that is info on how to get the game running, some hogwash about historical accuracy, and a bunch of hints to assist the confounded, or in my case, impatient. I wouldn't have gotten far enough to be able to cover this game without these. The discs themselves are moderately interesting. One is 400k, the other 800. If someone had an old Mac without a hard disk to copy one of these onto, then there would be a lot of disk swapping. As it is, the two disk images get dragged into the mini VMAC window and mount themselves ready for use. A few clicks later to boot the program and the player can now journey into a mystical world as a brave Sir Percival, a key figure in Arthurian legend. I'm not entirely sure if the game follows what he was supposed to do, but it's all bunkum anyway. Apparently there was a King Arthur at some point, but everything and everyone around him is completely made up. So here's an abridged telling of this tale that may or may not have anything in common with any of the source material that the characters came from. These are troubled times during the reign of King Arthur. Can't say for sure why, but it's hinted on a number of occasions. Sir Percy is looking to prove himself, so during a chat with King Arthur, is asked if he fancies a spot of adventuring to find the Holy Grail. And then the game ends. That was worth it. The tale of Sir Percy the Lazy. Now nah, seriously though, you need to type yes and only yes. Not yep, not absolutely, not rubber chicken. Oh, and don't even think about clicking on the king. Just yes. These text adventures are very picky. Right, so anyway, once... Who the hell is this? Why is he in Arthur's throne room attacking me? Um, my liege. Little help it. Oh, he's bolted. I'll, uh, come back later. Sorry about that, Arth. You were saying? Oh, right, find the grail. Yes, of course. Where'd you put it this time? Exit the throne room, get kitted up, feed a lump of sugar to a horse to gain its trust, and then ride it around England and a bit of Wales doing various things. I typed west a bunch of times and ended up in a forest where some chancer tried to ambush me. One slight kerfuffle later and he was dead, leaving behind a sabre and a single coin. Slim pickings then for a highwayman. Perhaps if he had based himself on an actual highway instead of a forest he might have had some success. Further into the forest is a hag who asks to marry you, more on her later, and further still is a chapel with a single use Solomon's sword and a shield, requiring more spiritual strength than Sir Percy currently has. So what's that? Well, as the player trots around doing various knightly deeds, they gain this attribute, which will eventually build up to 100%, and the game will be completable. So this is basically the mechanic that stops the player pelting to the final area at the start of the game. This figure is raised by praying at various locations, giving a sovereign and some food to some beggars, killing evil stuff, and so on. It can also fall by doing the wrong thing. I had a bit of trouble saving the game. I was hoping I could do it by typing it in. I got a bit frustrated and typed in some colourful terminology that the game took umbrage to and was swiftly docked a few spiritual points. Frickin' smart-ass devs. Anyway, back to the quest. I then went north to Yorkshire, where a path led to some funeral barrows, and it just so happened that the one Percy poked around in contained the body of St Lancelot. Goodness knows how the silly bugger managed to off himself, but he's very much dead and I didn't figure out that this Solomon's sword brought him back to life until later. So while he was busy being dead, I nabbed this splendid looking medallion. Looks much nicer on me than it does on a corpse. Anyway, let's leave Lancey Boy doing his thing and shove off to Carlisle. Carlisle is deserted, sans one peasant who explains that a sorcerer has commandeered an old watchtower nearby and started misbehaving. I went and had a look, found a snake, and died. Remember to save your game often. Stuff Carlisle then, let's go south and have a look around London. 
There's quite a bit going on here. One of the first people a player will bump into is this pilgrim. Give them a coin for some spirit strengthening, and then head to the most important location of the game. The pub. Okay, so it isn't that important, but it should be. Inside, you find a punter who... Oh, you again. Get lost, I want a pint. Wait, he's run away. How utterly pointless. I actually slowed that down with freeze frames. Here's how long he was on the screen for. Anyway, folks like this fella over here exist to give you hints to some of the game's riddles and puzzles. They're not all that complex, but they can't be guessed. Annoyingly, not all of these will be heard in a single playthrough due to limited funds. One particular example is the library, a bit further on from the pub, which has three hints that can be purchased with a gold coin. With only one gold coin to find in the whole of England, it makes sense to save scum before picking one so that one can reload the file and then pick the others. Elsewhere in London is the Tower of London where one can find Queen Guinevere. Despite being married to Arthur, she seems awfully concerned for Lancelot. He said he would send a token if all's well, eh? Well, here's where the medallion that I lifted from Sir Didalot came into play. I passed it on to save her from grief and got a dagger in return, which she apparently forged herself. Now here's where I made a major mistake, which resulted in having to go back to a fairly old save to undo it. I visited Stonehenge and was attacked by a mad druid for no particular reason. Maybe I trod on their special mushrooms on the way over. In line with genuine medieval medicine, I offered to let the madness out by thrusting the dagger into her to make some holes for it to escape. Instead of recovering, she died, which I thought was a bit unappreciative. The mistake here anyway was rocketing through the durability of the dagger. Each weapon has a finite number of uses before it breaks, and it turns out that this one had an important role to play later on, as explained by this random elf I found in a wood. An evil sorcerer may not be harmed by any weapon made by the hand of man. Yes, it's that old trope. With the dagger made by Guinevere, who is a lady, that was the only way to kill him, and I'd just wasted it on a useless high as a kite cultist. Elsewhere, these ruins have a Saxon ghost in them. Impervious to physical assault, apparently the player is supposed to offer them a weapon. He didn't want them in my playthrough, and my best guess was because I had already used up some of their durability. On another screen, fairly nearby, Percy tried to drink this lake only for it to completely dissipate, revealing a castle. Here, the Lady of the Lake hands over a talisman, which can be used to get into Merlin's glass tower, which totally should have been a glass castle, called Glassel. Merlin hands Percy the Philosopher's Stone with very little explanation as to what he might need it for, and sends him on his way. Meanwhile, in Salisbury, a young woman needs a hand rescuing her brother from an evil knight. Here she is in colour on the DOS version, and what's remarkable here is that she has lipstick on, an entire millennia before women started doing that sort of thing in the 1600s. Nip off to Cornwall, answer the question about what women want, the answer is their will, as is mentioned often enough elsewhere in the game, kill an evil knight and let the brother out, and pop back to the maiden to receive what is billed as a priceless gift. This is another potential mistake that could inhibit reaching the end of the game, as the Maiden proposes marriage, which is a decision that Percy can accept or decline. The correct decision is of course to decline, strengthening one's spirit rather than simply strengthening something else. With the magic of save files, I of course tried both options, where accepting the marriage proposal led to a heavily dithered image of her back and shoulder. According to the text, Percy sniffs her hair, and then exits south. Who says romance is dead? Despite it merely being a woman's back and a knight huffing at her locks, this was enough to influence the one write-up of the game that I could find on the internet, which was then copied and pasted all over the place that made it sound a lot more adult than it actually is. Anyway, head back to the chapel in Camelot and you'll find the hag from earlier that Percy is supposed to marry. When you kiss her, she transforms into a beautiful woman, who looks exactly the same as the other woman. Apparently, the ugliness was a curse. The farcical scene continues, with the woman explaining to Purse that she can only be beautiful for half of the day, and asks which half he wants it to be. Should one remember that what women want is their will, letting her decide results in the complete removal of the curse. I'm going to speed the rest of this up now. Stab the warlock, return the bones he nicked to a nun, grab directions through the tricky to navigate wastelands, known today as Scotland, sleep in a chapel, go for a boat ride, and so on and so forth. This is actually as far as I got. It's understandable that one might think the game is stupidly oversimplified in its plot, with no real reason for Percival to be doing half the things that he is, and for an adventure game, this is an immense weakness. The strength of the dialogue is supposed to carry the limited or non-existent visuals, but it has to be said, with Grail Quest, it falls flat on its ass. Once a player has played through it once, there's absolutely zero reason to do it again, and it becomes a series of arbitrary actions without the weak puzzle solving going alongside it. It's not a hard game, but Percy will often die at particular particularly bizarre times, and with the ability to stop oneself from progressing due to an incorrect decision taken much earlier, I could see a lot of players grinding to a halt with no understanding of what they did wrong and why they can't progress. I was 
missing the last little bit of strengthening of my spirit to enter one of the last areas in the game, and I cannot figure out what it is, unless it was that single curse that I typed in at the start. And if it is, then that's complete and utter bollocks. I'm sure as heck not playing through it again to find out. Grail Quest, then, is a very flawed title. It's worth looking at for a historical interest, as the Mac version is an early world builder title, and mechanically, it's one of the better ones. But it probably isn't going to be the first choice for anyone wanting to try out a computer adventure title from the 80s for fun. That said, I'm glad I have it, and I'm glad I've given it a spin. It's the first world builder engine game that I've played, and it's been a fairly interesting experience as a result. If it had just attempted to try and make the player feel like there was a reason for their actions and actually care about Sir Percy, with better and more dialogue to flesh out the plot, it could have been vastly superior. For downloads of the Macintosh version, see the links in the description to the Garden and the repo. You can try it yourself with the Mini VMac emulator or on an actual machine running System 6. There's also a link to the DOS version, which can be played in a web browser. With that then, we'll call time on this edition of YY's MG. Keep an eye out for new content by subscribing, and if you enjoyed this, do have a look over some of my other videos spanning genres, price points, and decades of pre-Intel Macs. Thanks for watching then, and see you next time.